it's time to finish out the day. Yesterday you might have noticed that the light... Is it working? <coughs> Testing. Is this working? Yeah. Four Good. score and seven years ago, the, qu the lazy brown fox jumped. Okay. <laughs> so yesterday you might have noticed that the lightning talks went last and Larry was but a warm up. Today, the lightning talks have moved forward because we have somebody that when you go home and say who did you, and your friends ask who did you see at this conference, they might actually know his name. <laughs> <laughs> so he took a long and winding road to get here. This time, sort of literally from Edinburgh, but as a career-wise, it's been a little winding too. Started as a pharmacist, did the code monkey thing before the dot-com bubble. Ed is the author of two modules on CPAN. But then he realized that you can be an author of another kind and actually make money. <laughs> so with 15 Hugo nominations and two wins, here he is, Charlie Strauss. Thank you, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. I'd like to apologize in advance for my chest because I've a mild chest infection <coughs> and I hope you can um, survive the uh, cacophonous coughing that will punctuate this talk. And um, I'd also like to say a word of thanks to bookings.com without whose kind sponsorship I wouldn't be here. Um, they are responsible for funding my travel. Thank you. And, um, yep, I've been asked to come here to deliver a keynote talk for uh, Yapsi North America 2034. <laughs> Hang on. Um, that's not right. This should be titled Keynote Talk for Yapsi North America 2014. Something's wrong here. Um, obviously, I must have had some success with the experiment on applied algorithmic causality violation. That's time travel as applied to computing. But I was thinking about starting sometime in the next 20 years in my next career as a card-carrying mad scientist. <coughs> or maybe that was some other me in some other parallel universe. But this isn't the file I remember writing. It's some other talk about a conference that hasn't happened yet and probably won't happen now if I read you their keynote. Um, it's probably not a good idea to do that. We wouldn't want to cause any temporal paradoxes, would we? So I'm not going to go there, at least not just yet. Um, before we take a look at the state of Pearl in 2034, we need to know where we stand today in 2014. So please allow me to start again. <clears throat> the world in 2014. Back in the 1990s, I used to argue with Pearl for a living. These days, I'm no longer a programmer by profession. Instead, I tell lies for money. I'm a science fiction writer. As my friend and fellow writer Ken McLeod observes, and he used to argue with computers too, he used to do COBOL, um, the secret weapon in science fiction's armory is history. So I'd like to approach the topic of his keynote sideways by where the trip down memory lane. From the year 2014, late in the English summer afternoon of a computer revolution, just before the sun set, all the way back to 1914. To the extent that the computing and information technology boom is a late 20th century and early 21st century revolution, um, we, can draw, we should be able to draw some object lessons about the overall shape of the technological change by looking at the trajectory of one of the other major technological revolutions that came before it. And I'm going to focus on the mass transportation revolution. Like all technological revolutions, the development of computers has followed a sigmoid curve of increasing performance over time. Slow to start up, very, very steep rise, and then tapering off towards the top. Each new generation of technology contributes to the next by providing us with the tools and machines needed to bootstrap their successors. 
The computer revolution did start slowly enough, but the development of a transistor galvanized it, and the integrated circuit and its offspring, the monolithic processor on a chip, upended the entire board game. Over a 50-year period, from roughly 1970 to 2020, we grew so accustomed to Moore's law, <coughs> the ad hoc law that the transistor count of a dense integrated circuit doubles roughly once every two years, that we actually unconsciously came to mistake it for a law of nature. But it's not a law of nature. In reality, it's nothing of the kind. It's really a representation of our ability to iteratively improve a process governed by physics until it converges on a hard limit. In the case of Moore's law, the hard limit, the governing constraint, if you like, on integrated circuits is electrical resistivity. As you shrink the length of a circuit, the resistance decreases. You can use lower voltages or lower current flows or run at a higher frequency. Physically, smaller circuits can switch faster. We build smaller integrated circuits by increasing the resolution of the lithographic process by which we print or etch surface features on semiconductors. But we're doomed to run into the limits of physics sooner or later. First, we lose energy as heat if we try to switch too fast. Secondly, current leakage becomes a problem as our circuits become smaller. And thirdly, at the end of the day, we're making stuff out of atoms, not magic pixie dust. It's not obvious how to build circuits with tracks less than one atom wide. <coughs> Similarly, if we look back at an earlier century, we can see that the speed and cost of mass transportation followed a similar sigmoid development curve from roughly 1830 to 1970. And for me, one of the most interesting things about this sort of technological revolution is what happens after we hit the end of the curve. Addressing this conference in 2014, I feel a lot like a fat, self-satisfied locomotive boiler designer addressing a convention of railway design engineers in 1914. We've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. <coughs> From the first steam locomotive, Richard Trevithick's 1804 Merthyr Tidville tramroad engine, to 1914, steam locomotives have surged out of the mines and ironworks and onto the permanent rails linking cities all over the world. They've crossed the American continent from east to west. They've reached the dizzy speed of almost 100 miles per hour, and they haul hundreds of passengers or hundreds of tons of freight on every locomotive. Speaking from 1914's perspective, it is apparent that if the current rate of improvement of a technology can be maintained, then steam traction has a bright future ahead of it. We can reasonably expect that by 2014, with improvements in signalling and boiler technology, our 200 mile per hour passenger trains will constitute the bedrock of human transport, and we, as boiler engineers, will be the princes of industry. <laughs> Pay no attention, I implore you, to those gasoline-burning automobiles. We can safely ignore them. They're inefficient and break down all the time. Away from the racetrack, they're no faster than a horse-drawn carriage. Cobblestones and dirt trails hammer their suspensions, quite unlike our steel rails lying on carefully leveled sleepers. And the carnage that results when you entrust motorised transport to the hands of a general public is so frightful that it's bound to be banned. <coughs> As for the so-called aeroplane, it's a marginal case. To make it work at all requires an engine that can produce one horsepower per pound of weight, a preposterous power-to-weight ratio, and its ability to carry freight is marginal. We might eventually see an aeroplane that can fly for 100 miles, at 100 miles per hour even, carrying up to a ton of mail or a dozen passengers, but it will never displace the mature, steadily improving technology of the steam locomotive from its position at the apex of mass transportation. <coughs> so that's the view from 1914. What actually happened? Well, as it happens, our locomotive boilermaker was absolutely right. 200 mile per hour steam-powered trains are the backbone of passenger transportation. 
Admittedly, the steam is heated in Electricité de France's nuclear reactors, a motive power conveyed to the trains by overhead electrical wires. The French aren't totally stupid. Nothing makes a steam boiler explosion worse, like adding 50 tons of reactor-grade uranium to the problem. <laughs> But it's not too much of a stretch to say that the European and Chinese high-speed rail networks are so efficient that they're taking passengers away from low-cost airlines on routes of less than 500 miles. But in places where we don't have a determined government building out the infrastructure to support shiny 200-mile-per-hour atomic-powered trains, or where we have to travel more than about 500 miles, airliners ate the railway's lunch. <coughs> The steam engines of 1914 and their lineal descendants were nowhere near the theoretical limits of a Carnot heat cycle engine, nor are they optimised for maximum efficiency in either power output or weight. Gas turbines offered a higher power density and lower weight and made long-haul air travel feasible. At the same time, the amount of infrastructure you need to build at ground level to support a given air route, namely two airports, is pretty much constant however far apart the airports are, whereas the cost of railroad tracks scales linearly with the distance. A 2,000-mile railroad route costs at least 10 times as much as a 200-mile railroad route. It also takes 10 times as long to traverse. Whereas a 2,000-mile plane journey, given jet airliners travelling at 500 miles per hour, costs no more to build and little more to operate than a 200-mile route. Furthermore, a big chunk of the duration of any airline flight is of fixed duration, a fixed overhead, the latency imposed by pre-flight boarding and post-flight unloading. Um, if you assume two hours at the start and to load an airliner, check-in, security, get your baggage on board, the whole drill, and an hour at the other end to unload everything, a 2,000-mile flight might take seven hours, three hours for getting on and off the plane and four hours in flight, but that's only twice the duration of a 200-mile flight. Two hours for getting on, an hour for getting off, and half an hour in the air. So air wipes the floor with rail once we cross a critical time threshold of about three hours, a combination both of latency and of the routing itself. Now, <clears throat> as for automobiles, our railroad engineer of 1914 completely overlooked their key advantage, flexibility. It turns out that many people find personal transport to be more valuable than fast or efficient transport. So much so that they were willing to pay for an unprecedented build-out of roads and a wholesale reconstruction of cities and communities around the premise of mass automobile ownership. At which point, the cobblestones and dirt trails were replaced by concrete and tarmac, driver and vehicle licensing laws were enacted, and cars got a whole lot faster and safer. Not to mention more reliable. Mind you, even as the steam locomotive fell into eclipse, it wasn't all plain sailing for the aircraft and automobiles. Today's airliners actually fly more slowly than the fastest passenger airliners of 1994. <coughs> it turns out, again, those pesky laws of physics come into play. We're constrained by the energy density of our fuels and the ability of our airframes to deal with the thermal stress of high-speed flight through air. Concorde the type specimen of a supersonic airliner was a gorgeous, technologically sophisticated dead end, but in the end couldn't compete economically with airliners that flew at half the speed but consumed a fifth as much fuel per seat. Concorde, in service, crossed the Atlantic in three hours with a hundred passengers, but it burned a hundred tons of jet fuel in the process. <coughs> A Boeing 747 would take twice as long, but could fly twice as far with five, nearly five times as many passengers on the same amount of fuel. Automobiles have more subtle limitations, imposed largely by our requirements for safety. They operate in close proximity to other people and vehicles, not to mention large animals. They have to be able to protect their cargo of passengers from the forces of impact if something goes wrong, while not imposing undue safety externalities on bystanders. Furthermore, they have to be manually controlled by poorly trained and absent-minded primates. <laughs> we have speed limits on our highways not because we can't build 200 mile per hour cars, we can, but because we can't reliably train all our drivers to be as safe as Michael Schumacher at 200 miles per hour. <coughs> now, the fact that we don't have 200 mile per hour automobiles in every garage 
or Mac 4 SSTs at every airline terminal, or 200 mile per hour nuclear powered express trains on Amtrak, shouldn't blind us to the fact that mass transportation industry is still making progress. But the progress it's making is much less visible than it used to be. It's incremental progress. It's a percentage here and a decimal point there all around the edges. We're not seeing order of magnitude improvements in capacity or throughput or speed anymore. <coughs> For example, when I talk about incremental improvements in aviation, let's look at the venerable Boeing 747 jumbo jet. The first generation one, the 747-100, carried roughly 400 passengers and had a maximum range of just over 6,000 miles. Today's 747-8 can fly 50% further on just 30% more fuel, thanks to its more efficient engines, and carries an extra 15% more passengers. Other airliners have become even more efficient. Both Pratt & Whitney and Rolls-Royce are now moving towards commercializing a technology called the geared turbofan engine, and they're anticipating up to 30% greater efficiency in jet engines of airliners in service over the next 30 years. But 30 years is the span of time that once separated the Wright Flyer from the Douglas DC-3. It's the same span of time that separated the Spitfire from the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. The Wright Flyer could make maybe 30 to 40 miles per hour. The DC-3 could carry passengers at 150 miles an hour. The Spitfire was a, 150, a 350 mile per hour piston engine fighter plane. The SR-71 could dash at over 2,000 miles per hour. Um, these are order of magnitude improvements. Um, and we're not seeing that. We're seeing percentage points. <coughs> um, incidentally, discursive moment here. I'm going to exclude from this discussion of incremental change the implications of the Tesla Model S for the automobile industry, an electric car that people actually aspire to own, or Google's self-driving car project, or Volvo's equivalent, which they're testing in um, Sweden at present. These are properly understood as developments emerging from, from a next technological revolution, the computing and information sector, which is still undergoing revolutionary change and disrupting earlier industries. Um, yeah, this is an important point. A new technological revolution has knock-on effects on mature products of earlier technological revolutions. But getting back to the topic in hand, what I'd like to emphasize is that over time, a series of incremental improvements in a mature technological field, be it engine efficiency or safety design or guidance technology, adds up to more than the sum of its parts. It's nothing like as flashy or obvious as a doubling of performance every two years while a new technology is exploding towards the limits physics imposes on what's possible. Linear improvements look kind of flat if they sort of follow a sigmoid curve. Um, even if they quietly revolutionize the industry they apply to over a longer period of time. And the punchline to this is that's what I think the future of the computing industry is going to look like. <coughs> So back to the present and the view forward. Now in 2014, we're inching closer, ever closer, to the end of Moore's Law. It seems inevitable that within the next decade, the biannual doubling of performance we've come to expect as our birthright is going to be a thing of the past. We had a brief taste of the end of the exponential revolution in computing in the early noughties. Um, many of you here will remember when a PC would have a 386 processor running at maybe 33 megahertz. Ten years later, we had Pentium 4s running at uh, 3 gigahertz and glowing red hot and melting at the edges. Um, the megahertz wars were terminated by spiraling power consumption and radio frequency interference. Um, we just couldn't make silicon run faster without going so much hotter that, well, by the time that silicon chips were putting out more heat per unit surface area than an electric iron, um, things that, it was not obvious how to, how to keep them cool any longer. <coughs> now, we're going to get a second dose of this at some point in the next decade because there'll be a point between 2020 and 2030 when we will no longer be able to draw ever finer features on our atomically perfect semiconductor wafers because to do so, we'd need to create features less than one atom wide. Um, for a while, progress will appear to continue. We'll see stacked architectures with more and more layers plastered atop one another, and we'll see more and more parallelism. But the writing is on the wall. 
Barring paradigm shifts, such as the development of a viable, mass-producible, room-temperature quantum computing architecture, we're going to hit the buffers, and we're going to do so real soon. One side effect of Moore's law, less often commented on, is that each successive generation of chip fab necessary in order to produce circuit features at ever finer resolutions also doubles in price from the previous generation. Once the manufacturers of the highly specialised equipment that goes into fab lines can no longer upsell Intel and the other foundries on new hardware, there are going, going to be interesting repercussions. We may see a vast shakeout of the hardware side of the semiconductor manufacturing industry. Um, something similar happened in aerospace between 1965 and 1975. Roughly half the US aerospace engineering faculty found themselves thrown out of work in just one decade when simultaneously the Apollo project wound down and the limits of the available technology for shoving bits of metal through the air at supersonic speed ran into the consequences of atmospheric friction and difficulty in handling supersonic shock waves. Um, alternatively, we may see a short-lived commodification of semiconductor manufacturing plants as suppliers desperately compete to stay in business and the cost of a new factory drops by an order of magnitude. Either way though, once the manufacturing costs of the factories are amortised, we can look forward to the commodification of the chips themselves. These will be the final generation of chips produced through the iterative process of ever finer resolutions. <coughs> um, there seems to be no market-imposed lower floor to the price of computing machinery. That is, the cheaper we can make chips, the more uses we can find for them. Now, at the same time, improvements in the efficiency of microprocessors at any given lithographic scale may continue for a while. Power consumption can be cut. Incremental design improvements can be applied. I'm willing to bet money that a 64-bit ARM core from the year 2034, made using a 7 nanometer process, will outperform a 64-bit ARM core from 2020, again using a 7 nanometer process, both on energy efficiency and manufacturing costs. We will just have gotten better and more streamlined at producing essentially the same component. Um, and these are both important factors in the total cost of ownership per MIP, but it's going to be incremental improvements. It's going to be a percentage point here, um, or a small coefficient there. It's not going to be the doubling of performance every couple of years that we've gotten used to. So we're going to be dealing with the same kind of sort of steady incremental improvements in tr that the transportation industry of today shows us, rather than the wildly surging sigmoid curve of the heyday of a semiconductor revolution. And we're going to be dealing also with a world full of ubiquitous, dirt-cheap, low-powered microprocessors with on-die sensors and wireless networking, which remain in production for decades because there's no prospect of a faster, cheaper, better product coming along anytime soon. And this has interesting social implications. <coughs> okay. So now I've bored you with the past, I'm going to give you a digest of what I found in the YAPC keynote that my time-travelling future self sent me from 2034. <coughs> um, but before I get there, because I'm going to tease you a bit, now we've taken a look at the world of, 1990, of 1914, I want you to bear with me as I describe the experiences of an earlier me from 1994 visiting the world of today by time machine. Um, once we've gone through his experiences in 2014, then we're going to leap forward 20 years and visit the world of 2034 together. The world of 2014 actually looks a lot like 1994, and this shouldn't surprise us. Change is gradual. Most of the buildings around us today were already here 20 years ago. Most of the people around us were also alive back then too. The world of 2014 is actually a wrapper around the smaller, less complicated world of 1994, adding depth and texture and novelties. It's a superset, in other words. The present is a superset of the past. And so my earlier self, visiting from 1994, would have found lots of things about the future that were startlingly familiar. <coughs> um, my 1994 self would have been utterly underwhelmed by the automobiles and airliners and architecture and fashion changes visible in 2014. 
After all, these are ephemera that follow constant, if unpredictable, trajectories. We know people are going to continue to use cars, they're continue to, going to continue to live in buildings and continue to wear clothing. These are sort of fairly constant. Um, the appearance of URLs in adverts everywhere might have made 1994 me raise an eyebrow. The World Wide Web was new and shiny and really slow and clunky in 94, but it was at least a thing and I was aware of it, so predicting that it would have spread like weed would have been an easy target. Nor would the laptops everybody here is carrying have been particularly remarkable. They're slimmer, shinier, cheaper and much more powerful than the laptop I owned in 1994, but they're still laptops. What would have weirded 1994 me out about this present would have been the way everybody walks around staring at these little glowing slabs of glass, <laughs> as if they're windows onto the sum total of human knowledge. <laughs> they kind of are, aren't they? Yeah, the idea of ubiquitous wireless networking and pocket computers with touch screens that integrate cellular phone services with data is the kind of thing that trips off the tongue, and any vaguely tech-savvy science fiction writer from 1994 should have expected this. Um, but that such devices are in every hand, from eight-year-olds to 80-year-olds, would be a bit of a reach. <coughs> In today's world, we tend to forget that in the early 1990s, the internet was an elite experience, a rare and recondite tool that most people didn't have much use for. The internet was for eggheads, corporate employees and scientists, not also computer science students, which is how I met it. 1994 was still the age of CompuServe and AOL. Remember AOL? That's kind of like a pre-internet version of Facebook. Computers were 20 years newer than they are today. Older folks didn't know how to type or use a mouse, and this was normal. The mere existence of smartphones would, of course, only be the beginning of 1994-me's culture shock. The uses people make of their smartphones, that would be endlessly weird and surprising. Lolcat macros. Online dating websites. Geocaching. Wikipedia. Twitter. 4chan. <laughs> if 1994 me had gotten onto 2014 Twitter, that would have been an eye-opener. The cultural shifts of the past two decades, facilitated by the internet, have been more subtle and far-reaching than 1994 me would have imagined. Briefly, and I'm going to break the rule that was described in one of our previous talks by talking politics, <laughs> the internet disintermediates people and things. Formerly isolated individuals with shared interests can form communities and find a voice. And once groups of people find a voice, they will not be silenced easily. Half the shouting and, upheave and social upheaval on the internet today comes from entrenched groups who are outraged to learn that their opinions and views are not universally shared. The other half comes from those whose silence was previously mistaken for assent. Once technologies get out of the hands of ordinary people, nobody can even begin to guess where they're going to end up, or what kind of social changes they're going to catalyse. <coughs> the internet has become a tool of revolutions, from Egypt to Yemen by way of Ukraine. It's also become a tool of political oppression. And before I stray too far onto the political quicksand, uh, let me get back to the topic. Let's go and borrow that time machine and take a look at 2034. 2034 looks superficially a lot like 2014, only not. After all, most of 2034 is already here for real in 2014. The one stunningly big difference that, as computer geeks, we can point to is that today we're still living through exponential change. But by 2034, the semiconductor revolution will have slowed down to the steady state of gradual incremental changes I outlined earlier. Change won't have stopped, but the armature of technological revolution will have moved elsewhere. So here's our whistle-stop tour of 2034. Of the people alive in 2014, probably 75% of us will still be alive. I feel safe in making this prediction because if I'm wildly wrong, if we've undergone a species-level extinction event, you won't be around to call me on my mistake. <laughs> That's the great thing about futurology. When you get it really wrong, nobody cares. <laughs> about two-thirds of the buildings standing in 2034 are already here, except in low-lying areas where the well-known liberal bias of climatological science has taken its toll. <laughs> 
automobiles look pretty much the same, although a lot more of them are electric or diesel-electric hybrids, and they exhibit a mysterious reluctance to run over pedestrians, shoot stoplights, or exceed the speed limit. It's almost as if all the drivers have been given a 30-point IQ boost. In fact, the main force opposing the universal adoption of self-driving automobiles will probably be the police force unions. And it's only a matter of time before the insurance companies arm wrestle the traffic cops into submission. <coughs> Airliners in 2034 look boringly similar to those of 2014, even more so than the automobiles. That's because airliners have a design life of 30 years. About a third of those flying in 2034 are already in service today, and another third are going to be new build specimens of models that are already flying, like Boeing 787s or Airbus 350s. Not everything progresses linearly, of course. Every decade brings a WTF moment or two to the history books. We've had 9-11, Edward Snowden, the collapse of the USSR. And then there are some obvious technology-driven radical changes that we can take a fair guess at happening. By 2034, Elon Musk will either have declared bankruptcy or taken his fluffy white cat and retired to his billionaire's lair on Mars. <laughs> China has a moon base. One of Apple, Ford, Disney or Boeing will have gone bust or fallen upon hard times, their niche usurped by somebody utterly unpredictable with today's knowledge. And I'm pretty sure that there'll be a cure for some, the, the, sorry, I'm pretty sure there'll be some utterly bizarre Rumsfeldian unknown unknowns to disturb us all. A cure for old age, a global collapse of the financial institutions, a devastating epidemic of Martian hyperscabies. <laughs> But most of the changes, however radical, are not going to be very visible at first glance. Um, skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, most change is gradual, and it's only when we stack enough iterative changes up atop one another that we get something that's immediately striking at a distance. The structures we inhabit in 2034 are going to look much the same. They're going to be buildings. Um, clothing is going to look like clothing. Um, even if the buildings are assembled by robots, or the clothing emerges fully formed from 3D printers that bond fibres suspended in a liquid matrix, and if the particular fashions have changed, they're still clothing and buildings, and the uses we have for them seem to be pretty much immutable across deep historic time. Um, these are examples of artefacts that may be manufactured using a variety of different techniques, some of which are not widespread today, but where the use case is unlikely to change. But there's a correspondingly different class of artefact that may be built or assembled using familiar techniques, but where the use case is utterly different. Take the concrete paving slabs that sidewalks are made from, for example. A concrete paving slab in 2034 is going to be almost identical to a paving slab in 2014, except for the trivial addition of a dirt-cheap 20-cent microcontroller powered by an on-die photovoltaic cell with a handful of uh, microelectromechanical sensors and a low-power transceiver. 20 cents, one chip, embedded in every paving stone. Manufactured in bulk, these chips are cheap, but um, it make, and, and it makes no difference to the logistics of building a, a, a sidewalk. Um, it makes as much difference, basically, as adding a barcoded label does for, to the manufacture and distribution of T-shirts. But the effect of a change is potentially revolutionary. Suddenly the sidewalk is part of the Internet of Things. <clears throat> what sort of things does our internetified paving slab do? Well, for one thing, it can monitor its ambient temperature and warn its neighbours to tell incoming vehicle traffic if there's a danger of ice or if a pothole is developing. <coughs> Maybe it can monitor atmospheric pressure and humidity, providing the city with a micro-level weather map. Genome sequencing is rapidly becoming the domain of microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS, and as semiconductor devices, these are amenable to Moore's law. Moore's law has actually hit genome sequencing to the point where the original Human Genome Project was costed at a few billion dollars. The next genome cost on the order of $100 million to sequence. These days, we're heading towards the $3,000 complete human genome, available pretty much by return of mail within a month. Um, this is, this is a, another of those sigmoid exponentials, and we're seeing it now in genomics. Maybe our paving stones could do ambient genome sequencing, looking for the telltale signs of pathogens in the environment. 
You know, does that puddle harbour mosquito larvae infected with malaria parasites? If so, call public health to spray it. <coughs> with low power transceivers and with protocols like Zigbee or the really low power Bluetooth, we're going down into nearly picowatts, something where a chip surface covered in photovoltaic cells can power a transceiver. Our network sidewalk slab can ping any RFID transponders that are carried across it, thereby, thereby providing a slew of rich and intrusive metadata about the sidewalk's users. If you can read the unique product identifier labels in a random pedestrian's clothing, you can build up a database that identifies all the citizens of your city who use the sidewalk uniquely, unless they habitually borrow each other's underwear. <laughs> you can probably tell from their gait pattern if they're unwell or depressed or about to impulsively step into the road, in which case your Internet of Things enabled sidewalk can notify any passing automobiles in the vicinity to steer wide of a self-propelled traffic obstacle. <laughs> <coughs> And you may think, crazy adult, but think in terms of a four-year-old chasing a ball or a runaway pet cat. You really, really, really want the cars to slow down or just take a different route rather than hit them. Um, it's not, but it's not just automobiles and paving slabs that have internet-connected processors in them in 20, 20, 2034. Your domestic washing machine is going to have a much simpler user interface. It's going to have a stop button and a go button. You shove clothing items inside it, and it asks them how they want to be treated, then moans at you until you remove the crimson dyed t-shirt from a batch of whites that will otherwise come out pink. <laughs> Meanwhile, your cheap Indonesian toaster oven has a concealed processor embedded in its power cable, but is being rented out by the hour to spammers or bitcoin miners or whatever the equivalent theft of service nuisance threat happens to be in 2034. <laughs> There have been strong rumours that this has already happened. In fact, by 2034, thanks to the fallout left by the end of Moore's Law and its corollary Kumi's Law, that power consumption per MIP decreases by 50% every 18 months, we can reasonably infer that any object more durable than a bar of soap and with a retail value of over $5 probably has as much computing power as your laptop today. And if you can't think of a use for it, the advertising industry will be happy to oblige. <laughs> we have, for better or worse, chosen advertising as the underlying business model for monetizing the internet. And the Internet of Things is an outgrowth of the internet. And I should remind you that the tail wagging the dog of a company we all know and love as Google was formerly called DoubleClick. That's where their money comes from. Anyway. A side effect of this is the world of 2034 is going to superficially resemble the world of 2014, apart from some minor obvious differences like more extreme weather and more expensive gasoline. But there are going to be some really creepy differences under the surface. With the build out of the Internet of Things and the stabilization of standards once the semiconductor revolution has run its course, the world of 2034 is going to be dominated by metadata. Today, those of us who are reasonably paranoid, and by reasonably paranoid I mean rationally paranoid, I don't mean wearing tinfoil hats, no actually, wearing tinfoil hats seems like a bloody good idea ever since the Edward Snowden leaks began coming out. <laughs> um, we can reasonably expect to be tracked by CCTV whenever we show our faces in public. Any photograph of us that somebody takes on their phone is going to be uploaded to Facebook where it will be tagged by location, time and identity using Facebook's offline face recognition software. We know our phones are tracking us from PicoCell to PicoCell as we walk around, and at the behest of the NSA, they can be turned into bugging devices without our knowledge or consent, as long as we're locked out of our own baseband processors. <coughs> By 2034, it's going to have gone a lot further. The NetMIT group at MIT's Computer Science and AI Lab are currently using Wi-Fi signals to detect the breathing and heart rate of individuals in a room. They can do this through walls. Wireless transmitters with steerable phased array antennae, like basically any really modern Wi-Fi base station, um, that can beam bandwidth throughout a house, are by definition excellent wall-penetrating radar devices. And just as the NSA has routed many domestic routers to inspect our packets, so we can expect the next generation of spies to attempt to use our routers to examine our physical packets. The Internet of Things needs to be able to rapidly create dynamic routing tables so that objects can communicate with each other. This much seems intuitively obvious. 
But a corollary of that requirement is that everything knows where it is and who it belongs to and who has permission to use it. This has good consequences and bad consequences. Good consequences. Shoplifting and theft are going to be difficult to get away with in a world where unsold goods know when they're being abducted and call for help. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Collapsing and dying of a stroke in your own home may also become a rare event if our environment is smart enough to monitor us for anomalous behaviour indicative of a medical emergency. But then there's the bad stuff. Do you really want your exact pattern of eye movements across the screen of your smartphone to be monitored and analysed, the better to beam tailored advertisements into your peripheral field of vision while you check your email. Hello Amazon, I'm looking at you. Or do we want every conversation in every public space within range of a microphone to be converted via speech to text, indexed and analysed by NSA server farms for the Bayesian spore of conspiracy? Because nobody has ever used sarcasm while discussing terrorism, ever. <laughs> Do you really want your implanted cardiac defibrillator to be rooted and held to ransom by a piece of malware that doesn't know it's running on a life-critical medical device rather than a PC? Arguably, these are the paranoid worries of a poopy head from 2014, not a savvy native of 2034 who's had two decades to get used to the emergence of these new phenomena. The denizens of 2034 will have been sitting in the steadily warming saucepan of water for two decades, and their concerns are going to look a bit different. From their point of view, the worst thing about the Internet of Things is that it's built atop the 70-year-old bones of ARPANET. It's insecure by design, horribly flawed and susceptible to subversion. Back in the early days, national security bureaucrats deliberately weakened the protocols for computer to, compu to computer communications, sorry, tongue twister there, so that they could monitor at will. They never really anticipated that it would become so fundamental to our entire civilization that by making it vulnerable, they were preparing the field for entire criminal industries and rendering what should have been secure infrastructure vulnerable to what is unironically termed cyber attack by their own descendants. <coughs> Vetoing endpoint encryption in TCP might have seemed like a good idea in the early 1980s when only a few hundred thousand people, industry professionals and scientists, were expected to use the internet. But it's a disaster when your automobile needs a reliable, secure stream of trusted data about its environment to tell if it's safe to turn the next corner. <coughs> but. We hit the buffers at the end of a railroad track of exponentially accelerating semiconductor tech around 2020. The industry downsized and aged. There's no money to develop and roll out new standards, nor the willpower to do so. Trying to secure the Internet of Things is like trying to switch the USA to driving on the left or adopting the metric system. <laughs> Pre-existing infrastructure has tremendous inertia. To change it, you first have to flatten it, and nobody much wants to destroy Western civilization in order to clear the ground for rolling out IPv8. <laughs> so, here's a takeaway list of bullet points for 2034. 2034 is going to superficially resemble 2014. However, every object in the real world is going to be providing a constant stream of metadata about its environment, and I mean every object. The frameworks used for channeling this fire hose of environment data are going to be insecure and ramshackle with foundations based on decades-old design errors. The commercial internet funding model of 1994, advertising, is still influential and its blind spots underpin the attitude of the Internet of Things to our privacy and security. How physical products are manufactured and distributed may be quite different from 2014. In particular, expect far more 3D printing at endpoints and less long-range shipment of centrally manufactured finished products. But in many cases, how we use the products may be the same. P politics alert here. The continuing trend towards fewer people being employed in manufacturing and greater automation of service jobs will continue. <coughs> Our current societal model, whereby we work to earn money with which to buy the goods and services we need, may not be sustainable in the face of a continuing squeeze on employment and a continued cent centralisation of capital assets. But since when has co consistency or coherency or even humanity been a prerequisite of any human civilization in history? We'll muddle on, even when an objective observer might look at us and shake her head in despair. And now for the state of Pearl in 2034. You knew I was going to get here eventually, didn't you? <clears throat> yeah. 
I'm reading from a keynote talk of YAPC NA 2034 by Charles Stross, recovering pearl hacker, science fiction writer, and card-carrying mad scientist, Paratemporal Meddling Management Group. Specialty, screwing up history. <laughs> Frankly, I'm kind of astonished to be standing here in 2034, talking to you about a programming language that first escaped into the wild 45 years ago. And not just because my continued existence is a testimony to the benefits of medical science. It's because the half-life of a programming language, back when people were still inventing new programming languages, was typically about 10 years. <coughs> programming languages come and go, and mostly they go. Back in the dim and distant past, in the early days of the computing revolution, programming languages were rare. We rode out the 1950s on just three of them. Fortran, Lisp, and the embryonic product of a codicil conference on data systems languages, COBOL. Then the 1960s saw a small Precambrian explosion, bequeathing us Algol, go-to considered harmful, basic as supporting evidence for the prosecution, and a bunch of hopeful monsters like Snowball 4, BCPL, and Pascal, some of which went on the rampage and did enormous damage to our idea of what computers are good for. <coughs> then, over the next two decades, from 1970 to 1990, compiler design wormed its way into the syllabus of undergraduate CS degree courses, and a number of languages mushroomed. Even though most sane CS students stick to re-implementing Lisp in Haskell and similar five-finger exercises, there are enough fools out there who suffer from the delusion that their ideas are not only new but useful to other people to keep the linguistic taxonomists in business. Student projects seldom have the opportunity to do much harm. For a language to do real damage, it needs a flag and an army. But if by some mischance a frustrated language designer later finds themselves in a managerial role at a company that ships code, they can inflict their personal demons on anyone unlucky enough to be caught within the blast radius of a proprietary platform and a supercritical mass of extremely bad ideas. <laughs> Much more rarely, and there's one in the audience here today, a language designer actually has something useful to say. Not just an urge to scratch a personal itch, but an urge to scratch an itch that lots of other programmers share. The degree of success with which their ideas are met often depends as much on the timing when they go public as on the content. Which brings me back to the matter in hand. Even 20 years ago, in 2014, Pearl was no longer a sexy, paradigm-busting newcomer, but a staid middle-aged citizen, living in a sprawling but somehow cluttered mansion full of fussily decorated modules of questionable utility. <laughs> that people are still gathering to talk about new developments in Pearl after 45 years is, well, it's no crazy even the idea that people would be drafting new standards for COBOL in the 21st century would have seemed if you put the idea to Grace Hopper in the early 1960s much less object-oriented COBOL, or the 2018 standard for functional COBOL with immutable objects. <laughs> so why is Pearl still going in 2034, and why is there any prospect whatsoever of it still being a thing in 2134? <coughs> By rights, Pearl in 24 ought to have been a dead language. The law of averages is against it. The half-life of a programming language in the latter half of the 20th century is like an unrefrigerated yoghurt in a heat wave. As a holdover from 1987, Pearl should be well past its sell-by date. But, um, I'm going to fast forward again because I'm running late and you're all bored. <laughs> okay, I won't fast forward. Pearl, like other scripting languages of the late 20th century, was susceptible to a decade-long cycle of fashion trends. In the 1990s, it was all about the web, and in particular the web 1.0 transactional model, now dying if not dead, replaced by more sophisticated client server or distributed processing frameworks. Um, whoops, excuse me. Um, while Perl was always far more than just a scripting language for writing quick and dirty server-side CGI scripts, that's the context in which many programmers first encountered it. And indeed, many people approached Perl as if they thought it was a slightly less web-specific version of PHP. But Perl isn't PHP, any more than it's Python or Ruby. Perl 5 is a powerful, expressive, general-purpose, high-level programming language with a huge archive of modules for processing data and interfacing to databases. Pull 6, if and when we finally get there, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> well, 
is almost a different beast. Essentially, as I understand it, a toolkit for creating application domain-specific sublanguages. And while Perl and its modules were once a bit of a beast, as anyone who ever had to build Perl 5 from scratch on a workstation powered by a 33 MHz 030 will recall, by today's standards it's svelte and fast. If what you're juggling is a city-wide street network with an average of one processor per paving slab, generating metadata at a rate of megabytes per minute per square meter of sidewalk, it pays to distill down your data as close to source as possible. And if those paving slabs are all running some descendant of Linux, probably by way of Android, and talking to each other over IP, then some kind of data reduction and data mangling language is probably the ideal duct tape to hold the whole thing together. <laughs> But Perl also has a secret weapon in the language longevity wars. And I'm looking at it right now because that secret weapon is you. <coughs> Back when I went to my first Yapsi in London in the late 90s, I had no idea that I'd return to one in Orlando in 2014 and see several familiar faces in the audience. And I'm pretty sure my 2034 future hypothetical self will recognize some of those faces again in the audience at Yapsi NA 2034. Perl has a culture Curated since the early days of the Perl 5 Porter's mailing list and the Complang Perl Usenet group and elsewhere. And I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but for better or worse, Perl tends to attract die-hard loyalists and has a culture not only of language use but of contribution to the pool of extensions and modules that form CPAN and also of curating the discussion within the language and its user community. We've seen talks here this afternoon on how to handle discussions, how to deal with newbies, how to answer questions, how to address trolls. This is really important. Um, the culture has become a self-perpetuating thing in its own right. Um, also, Perl was invented just late enough in the semiconductor revolution that it stands a chance of still being in use by a die-hard core of enthusiasts and loyalists when the progress dictated by Moore's law finally hits the buffers and everything slows down. If a technology is invented and discarded during, during a technological revolution, before the revolution matures and reaches the limits dictated by physical law, then it will probably remain forgotten or a niche player at best. In aerospace, the classic examples of a biplane and the rigid airship, or Zeppelin, they worked. They, were, they led in their class in the early days, <coughs> but they were inefficient compared to alternative, more modern designs, and so they're unlikely to be resurrected in future. If a technology, however, if a technology was still in use when the revolution finally hit the buffers and the dust settled, then it'll probably remain in use for a very long time. The variable pitch propeller, the turbofan, and the aileron. It's hard to see any of them vanishing from the skies anytime soon. Perl, in 2014, is a mature language, but it's not a dead language. The community of Perl loyalists is aging and greying, but we're still here and still relevant. And the revolution it is embedded within is due to end sometime in the next 10 years. And by revolution, I mean period of very, very rapid change. If Perl is still relevant in 2024, then it will certainly still be relevant in 2034, because just as the world of operating systems research stagnated after 1990, as Rob Pike has lamented, so the world of programming languages are, intimate, are intimately dependent on the pace of change of the underlying hardware. And once the hardware freezes or switches to incremental change over a period of decades, the drive to develop new tools and new languages will subside enormously. Um, this is inherent in the way revolutions work. The, the aftermath of a revolution is very, very sensitive to fluctuations in the conditions during the revolution itself. So my takeaway for Perl is just keep going, folks. Focus on modules, focus on unit testing, focus on big data, on data mining and transformation, on large-scale distributed low-energy processing, Focus on staying alive. Perl is 27 in this year, 2014. If Perl is still alive when it's 37 in 2024, then the odds are good it will make it to 2034 and then to 2114. Let's just hope we get that cure for old age I think I mentioned earlier among the unpredictable unknown unknowns. People are going to need you guys to still be around for a long time to come doing software maintenance and bug fixing. Thank you.